route, hugging the coastal corridor here, the ancient, um, these ancient peoples moved south where they subsequently split into two further groups, the, uh, the North Native uh, Americans and the South Native Americans. The South Native Americans were the ones that populated most of the Southern continent into South America. Now I want to present today some of the newest information that we've got about the peopling of the Americas and it comes from a really important discovered site in the state of Zacatecas in Mexico, uh, denoted here by the square in the center of the diagram. And the site is called Chiquihuite Cave. It's been excavated since 2012 by our colleague Cyprian Ardelian from the University of Zacatecas. He discovered the site in 2010 on site surveying. The site is unique. It's a high altitude site in the Astillero Mountains. And you can see uh, here in this illustration, the location of the site. It's a limestone cave and it sits more than 2,700 meters above sea level and more than a thousand meters above the valley floor. It takes about three to four hours to walk up to the site. So it's a very uh, difficult and inaccessible climb. And the view from the top is um, very impressive as you might imagine. The site itself is comprising of a limestone cave, which is formed by dissolution and roof collapse. It measures about 50 meters wide and about 15 meters high. And in 2012, early excavations at the site revealed the presence of early human um, uh, artifacts, perhaps at that stage, early stage, more than 26,000 years ago. Since that time, an area of around 62 square meters has been excavated down to a depth of around three meters. The site is inaccessible, as I've said, so the excavation team lives in the site for weeks at a time undertaking these excavations. It's a very challenging and difficult environment. But what has been revealed are the remains of um, stone tools like these. The tools that have been found include cores and flakes and blades and a whole range of different uh, items. And more than 1900 stone tools have been excavated. They include um, the remains of what we call debitage. In fact, about 60% of the material is debitage. This is material that is from the construction or the manufacturing of these um, stone tools. And the material that is made from is, uh, is a recrystallized limestone that comes in two forms. Interestingly, this type of stone isn't found inside the cave itself. It comes from another place. We're yet to find the location. Our job as part of the excavation team and analysis team is to um, determine the chronology. And we've dated more than 50 radiocarbon and optical dates. Um, my student here on the left-hand side, Lorena Becerra Valdivia, takes huge must take huge credit for this work. It was um, the bulk of her PhD dissertation. And uh, we radiocarbon dated um, a great range of samples using our Mikardis accelerator, which you can see on the right hand side of the slide. What we discovered was that humans uh, were at the site more than 30,000 years ago. And that, interestingly, the site was occupied by people before, during and after the so-called last glacial maximum. This is the peak of the ice age when the temperatures were as cold as they could ever have been between 26 and 19,000 years ago when the sea levels thereby uh, fell to a very low level. And the site was occupied periodically up until about 13,000 years ago when it was closed due to a landslide. At the very base of the site, at around 30,000 years ago, we find archaeological remains. Um, for example, this bifacial lanceolate tool was found and dated by virtue of a small piece of charcoal found nearby that was dated to around 30,000 years ago. And if we look at the section of the site, this is a cutaway view from the top of the site down to the bottom. This is the layer that corresponds to the last glacial maximum, this very cold period. And below it, we find 200 stone tools and manufactured debitage, which indicate the very early presence of humans at this archeological site. We've also got evidence that has been uh, obtained from the site using environmental DNA. And this was undertaken by our colleagues at the geogenetics, uh, of the geogenetics group in Copenhagen, led by Eske Villaslev and Mikkel Peterson. Uh, intriguingly, it's now possible to extract and uh, to analyze environmental DNA from sites such as these. And this gives us an insight not only into the types of bones that were in the site and the animals that were in the site, but also the types of plants. So we can reconstruct the environment around the site. And what we found is that we have evidence for a range of mixed forest species, including junipers, firs, spruce, and pine, complemented by grasses. 
the environment outside would have looked a little bit like um, modern day uh, British Columbia or, or, or Oregon rather than the desert that it is today. And amongst the bone species, we found evidence for condors, marmots, goat, sheep, horses, as well as bears. Another, the other paper that we published uh, last week uh, dealt with the dispersal and the timing uh, of the uh, earliest human dispersals. And for this, uh, my student Lorena Becerra Valdivia and I analyzed hundreds of radiocarbon dates from more than 40 sites right across the Americas. And we um, analyzed all of the radiocarbon dates and we plotted them in plots like this, which show the peak of the frequency and the probability density of different uh, radiocarbon dates. And what you can see are three pro probability distributions that correspond to the bulk of these archaeological sites. The first one corresponds just to Chicahuite Cave. The second one, around 25,000 years ago, um, embraces about 12 or 13 sites that date to this pre Clovis period. And the last group, centering on about 15,000 years ago, are the bulk of the archaeological sites. And what we can do is we can plot these spatio temporally. So Here's what those archaeological site distributions looked like at 20,000 years ago. You see they're all concentrated in the lower parts of the US. And then by 18,800 years ago, a similar distribution. By 1,600 years ago, nothing much has changed. But by 14,600 years ago, we have this huge spike in occupied sites and probably populations and distribution of people. And this is mirrored also when we look at the last group of dates at around 14,150 years ago. When we plot these archaeological sites, um, comparing them against climate, we can see something very interesting. Here, for example, you can see at the end of the Ice Age, there's a sudden peak in global climate as the climate warms. This evidence comes to us from Greenland, from the Greenland ice cores. Over the course of about three years, the climate warms between seven to 10 degrees. And we find that this increase in archaeological site occupation and probably evidence for increased human populations coincides with this increase in global temperature. We find similar patterns in other parts of Eurasia and Europe too. Finally, what then of these large extinct, now extinct animals of North America, around 26 genera went extinct uh, at this time. Were humans to blame or was it climate? Well, when we plot the last appearance data of animals like mammoth and mastodon and horse, what we find is that they too plot very close to this proliferation of archaeological presence and archaeological sites at around Greenland Interstadial 1, this pulse of, 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 of climate warming. So we feel that there is, um, it's very difficult for us to be sure, but we feel that it's more likely that humans had a role to play in megafaunal extinctions than, than climate change did. Um, but more work is required before we can finalize this and understand more about it. But that summarizes some of the work that we've been doing, um, which, as I say, was published uh, just last week. So now I'm going to hand over to Gregor Larson to talk about dogs. Thank you, Tom. Uh, that's absolutely fascinating. And it, it dovetails beautifully with a lot of the work that we've been doing rather coincidentally as well. I wanted to start firstly by saying what an honor and, and privilege it is to be doing this, but also how deeply strange it is to be in a room by myself looking out on a garden without seeing any of the actual audience. When Tom and I give talks, we, there's usually tens to hundreds of thousands of people there cheering on our every slide. And in this case, it's difficult to know when we say something that might be remotely funny, whether or not that lands or not. And so Tom and I have worked out a plan that there are a few jokes littered in some of the slides to come. And if they are funny, Tom is going to provide some sort of signal to you as though it was like a 1980s television show where there was a laugh track. So if you weren't sure the joke was funny, the laugh track would tell you it was, and then you would smile on your sofa while watching along. So um, Tom is going to let you know when that happens. Uh, what I wanted to do, though, is start with more of a, a kind of a philosophical perspective on how we get to the, the bottom of some of these big questions about the peopling of Americas and generally about the kind of migration and dispersal of people around the world. So this first slide that I've got. It shows a series of footprints, and this is often used as a motif to kind of reflect how we are trying to, to pick up a signal. And what is interesting about footprints is that they are really a residual signal or kind of an accidental echo of 
an event that has taken place before. The person walking along here didn't intend to leave footprints, but they did so. And so by looking at those footprints, you can, make, you can get a whole bunch of information about the direction and speed and a whole bunch of other things. And when you're thinking about the peopling of America's archeology span in general, there tends to be a pretty big focus on looking specifically for human remains. And in that previous paper that Tom was talking to you about, a lot of those radiocarbon dates are associated either with directly with human remains or one of the residual signals that you find a lot in, in archeology span are stone tools, a lot of what, of what Tom talked about as well. Though, of course, there's a whole long and very large compendium of other signals and accidental echoes that we can take a look at, some of which are unintentional. Tom? So the first example that I can uh, wanted to tell you about is that this is a, a Peruvian mummy. So if you wanted to know the date of this person, you could go and ra directly radiocarbon date these bones and you could learn a lot about this person by looking at all of the artifacts and everything else around this person. But what you can also do is look at the kind of more accidental elements of this, which in this particular case is a lice that was found in the hair. And you can genetically analyze the lice that is found in this person's hair and compare them to lice found on clothing artifacts and hair artifacts across people all over the world. And the lice, the, the genetic signals of the lice give you a perspective about the origins of clothing and the roots that people took and often when they mixed and the sort of evolution of both body, body lice and hair lice. In addition to lice, there are also a series of other uh, accidental things that we carry with us. In this particular case, these are intestinal parasites that some of us may still have, uh, including tapeworms and a whole range of other fun things. And these intestinal parasites we carry with us as we're walking around and unbeknownst to ourselves, we often leave them around. So if you were say a, um, a mercantilist in medieval, the medieval Hanseatic League, then in Northern Europe, Tom, <laughs> and you were somewhere in this area here, then it's, it's from time to time, not only would you occasionally be eating raw meat or raw fish, and you would probably be riddled with a lot of these parasites, these intestinal parasites, but these would then come out when you were sitting on these communal latrines. And a colleague of ours just in the last year or so then analyzed the genetic signature from the intestinal parasites to try and work out the different trade routes and where people were, again, sort of as this accidental footprint. In other cases though, some of our footprints are a lot more intentional. Uh, in some cases, very obviously so. So here, what you'll see is an absolutely massive rabbit. Now, this rabbit is terribly, terribly funny. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Yes, so funny, in fact, we'd have to have a laugh track to tell you exactly how funny it is. Now, she, this woman is, is pushing the rabbit a little bit closer to the lens, but I can assure you that there are these, there's a breed of giant rabbits that sell for thousands of dollars uh, to people who just want to own giant versions of rabbits. Now, what's inter interesting is that people for a very long time have had a close association with rabbits and have taken those rabbits up on board ships and then seeded islands for when they would go back later in order to try and harvest them through one means or another. And there was a survey a little while ago that showed a global map that depicted all the different islands on which there are current populations of rabbits. There's more than 800 of these everywhere on the planet which suggests that this is one of these kind of accidental things that people do in a way. If you were an alien, you came down, you're like, wow, rabbits are enormously successful at getting all these, all these phenomenal islands it's from the extreme north in the Aleutians all the way down to the, the bottom of New Zealand. And of course, we know that these are all here per, per, entirely because the humans place them there. And there's a lot of this. Another way, another domestic animal that people have used is looking at pigs. And some of our work that we've done where we use the signature of ancient pigs found on Pacific islands to try and locate the origins of the pigs from which they were originally taken by people as Polynesians moved out into the Pacific. And from this, we were able to work out a very clear uh, association with pigs that were in Vietnam and then a very clear route through island Southeast Asia and the Pacifics and that overturned a hypothesis that people had come through the Philippines necessarily, or at least the pigs had. So we can, by looking at all these separate residual signals, we can start working out not just the people, but everything else that they're bringing with them and how it all relates into a much larger package of, of people and stuff and animals and microbes and everything else. Which then of course raises the question about dogs because dogs are our very first domestic. And if you know anything about dogs or if you have one, if say there's a giant storm coming in and they say, well, you have to leave town because the a uh, hurricane is gonna uproot your house. You, if you leave, you're gonna take your dog with you. And for a very long people, period of time, that's precisely what people are doing. So two recent studies that we've been involved with, the first of which showed uh, in Europe, we know that hunter-gatherers prior to any uh, origins of settled agriculture had dogs of their own. They were burying them with grave goods. They made a big difference to the people's lives who had them. And for the in purposes of this, we were able to characterize them genetically and we call them the yellow dog. So everything in, in Mesolithic Europe prior to the arrival of farmers from the Near East were all yellow. 
Then as soon as farmers started coming in, well, here's not a big surprise. The farmers had a very different kind of dog than the hunter gatherers did. And these are the green dogs. And the very first arrival that we see of the green dogs into Europe is by with, associated with uh, farming context, which is what's really nice about this is that the genetics is allowing us the resolution to be able to distinguish between populations, very small subpopulations of the same species and the same animal, which would be otherwise difficult to tell apart using just the, the, the size or shape of the bones alone. Another very good example of this actually comes from North America, where in we realized a few years ago that there was a very different population of dogs, at least south of the ice in the Americas, and we suspect that they were further north as well. And in this case, they're represented by all those purple dots. And what we then saw was that starting about a thousand years ago, as the Inuit came in, again from Beringia, but a much, much later period of time when other people had arrived at the Americas, they brought with them their very own blue dogs, which were very, very different from the purple dogs that existed south of the ice. And these blue dogs, again, are associated with material culture that suggests that they were involved in quite a bit of sledding, and they made a huge difference to the particular cultures of people that were coming in. So we can begin to distinguish not just that they're the different kinds of dogs, but the different sorts of styles in which the dogs are uh, fit into human life ways as those people are exploiting environments in, in very different ways from other populations. This image is a picture of the earliest dog thus far, radiocarbon dated in the Americas. This is a dog from Coster in Illinois. It's radiocarbon dated to about 10,000 years ago. And from this dog, we were able to get a genome and then compare that with about 70 or so dogs that we got that were all from pre-European contact of the Americas. And what we haven't done yet, though, a paper just came out from this site called Paisley Cave, which you might have seen on Tom's map as well. And as a at Paisley Cave, there's another kind of residual signal or accidental echo that we are leaving you behind all the time. And you'll probably recognize these. These are coprolites. And so uh, coprolite is simply petrified or slightly mildly petrified poo. And what they found from this cave, that, a paper that was just out that we weren't involved in about a week and a half ago, was that most of the, the uh, coprolites that they found were from humans. But there were quite a few there that were from dogs as well, and they radiocarbon dated until about 12,000 years ago. So it's curious that the oldest dog bones that we have are 10,000, but the oldest dog poo we have is about 12,000. So what we were able to do, and this map quite, hasn't quite shown up the way that I would have preferred, but what we were able to do is when the analysis of all the really old dogs in the Americas, we contracted, and you can see where it says modern, there's an arrow that's difficult to see, the small red triangle at the bottom of that tree there. That's all global modern dogs, all the variability we've squashed into a tiny little fragment there. And then where it says American dogs with the arrow that's a bit disappeared there is in yellow. All of those dogs are represent the dogs that were in the Americas prior to any European arrival. Now, what two things are intriguing about this. One, that there was a phenomenal amount of variation in the Americas before any dogs were introduced by Europeans. But secondly, that none of those dog lineages persisted after the Europeans arrived. So we have a huge turnover and a huge disappearance. And again, we have dogs resembling humans. Uh, we, the population size estimates of people in the Americas top over several million. And of course, after the Europeans arrived, there was a huge population um, uh, denudation where everybody, quite a few people went away and the dogs are no different from so what we've done recently, and this work is, is as yet unpublished, it's still in review, is what we were able to do is start to put some molecular clock analysis on some of the genetics that we have from some of these ancient dogs. And what we started to realize was that this particular group of dogs in the Americas, that again is unique to the Americas, we called A to B because that's what we do. We give things numbers and letter codes. And what we found was that there are four separate what we call subclades within A to B, one, two, three, and four. And those are on the right-hand side of the slide there. Tom, if you down arrow, you can see. And what we can do is put a radiocarbon signal or a genetic signal put on top of a molecular clock analysis. And we can work out what we call the most recent common ancestor or the time to when, when it was that the most the common ancestors that, that gave rise to all these four different lineages must have exist. And Tom, if you down arrow one more time, you'll see that what we come up with is the initial starting point for those four lineages, again, after they arrive in North America or just around that same period of time in Beringia is about 15,000 years ago. Now, what's a whole lot of fun about this is that we did a very similar analysis on a completely different data set of a lot of the human data that Tom was just talking about. And again, quite coincidentally, and this may be a coincidence, although it's tempting to try and assign them, because what we have is not one, not two, not three, but actually, just like the dogs, four lineages of Native Americans as well. And Tom, if you down there, you can show those four. And then what we have is the most recent common ancestor of those, again, completely different data set, and we come up with 15 and a half thousand years ago. So the error bars on this are such that that's pretty much, we could say, is virtually the identical thing. And if we layer the two of them on top of each other, we have dogs on the top, humans on the bottom. And what you can see is that the 
Tom, one more time down there, the, the coincidence between those two things is virtually identical, or at least it's very difficult to distinguish them. So what's really fun about this is that we can start to begin to say that, well, actually, maybe what Tom is talking about here with his big explosion actually is a separate group of people that are arriving with dogs. And there very well may have been, if there absolutely wasn't, people in the Americas before this. But this is a different group of people coming in who had dogs with them. And that may have had something to do with the extinction of the megafauna, may have had something to do with the big demographic explosion, any number of things. But this really tight correlation is something that's, that's fascinating we're continuing to explore. And the reason for this, Tom, if you down here one more time, is that, um, as I was saying before with the hurricane, if this is how mo a lot of us feel about our dogs and, and we wouldn't be caught dead without them. In fact, that's a lot of people in the Mesolithic felt about their dogs because they were actually buried with them. In fact, many times people buried their dogs with grave goods that were commensurate or even superior to what a lot of the people have. I mean, dogs have been people to most people on earth for a very, very long period of time. So that we, rather than thinking about dogs as a proxy necessarily or as a residual accidental echo, in very many ways, when we are looking at dogs, we are looking at people and they're, they're so much the same thing that it almost looks like they are the same thing, slide, and that most of us pretty much are this. So that it, we are our dogs and if you were to look at us, you'd get the same signature in the dogs and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And that pertains not just to our genetic histories, but to our diets and our clothing and our fashion sense and a million other things. Thank you very much. Gregor, thank you very much indeed. And thank you so much to Tom as well for a uh, magnificent double header there on a whole variety of really astonishing new ways to look at things. I think that final slide there says it all in a sense. You'll never see the world, whether of humans or dogs, again, in quite the same sort of a way. And entirely deservedly, there has been a huge variety of questions coming through on our platforms, including actually, I have to say, some that are not um, uh, questions necessarily, but actually comments uh, as well. So just to say, Ray and Jessica both like the rabbits, just so you know. Excellent. I hope they're laughing. Yeah, I'm probably going to be sourcing, sourcing the supplies sooner rather than later. Before we kick in with some questions, I just want to ask one thing which actually has to do with the nature of this as research, because you've um, mentioned, I and mean, Gregor was talking about the fact that the previous uh, research is, you know, still in peer review, it's all very fresh off the, um, uh, off the lab, uh, the face of the lab. Um, perhaps, I mean, throw it back to you for a moment, perhaps, Tom, what would you say is perhaps the most important change in the way in which scientists and archaeologists have been looking at the things you've been talking about, let's say in the last 10 years, and then I'll bring in Pat Gregor for his view on that as, uh, as well. But, you know, uh, if, if we've been having a talk in 2011 rather than 2020, yeah. what, what might have been different? To them? So um, I think that uh, th in the last few years, there have been a series of very big steps forward in the field of the first Americans and first American studies. On, on, and I'm, I'm speaking with, a, with my archaeological scientist hat on. Um, the, the scientific, the range of new scientific techniques that we have uh, at our disposal now has allowed us to really start to push uh, um, some of the big unanswered questions in um, not just in the Americas, but in world archaeology and world archaeological terms as well. Um, our research lab that Gregor and I both work in is, is, a, is a center for um, the development of new methods to look at the archaeological past. And so we have a proliferation of new techniques, you know, bioarchaeology um, and bioarchaeological techniques are allowing us to probe molecular um, information from the, the remains that we find in archaeological sites. I, I can give you a range of examples, but we've already talked um, a great deal about the genetics. And genetics has been a revolution uh, as far as um, the studies of the first Americans has have been concerned. But there are a range of other things as well that we can look at, you know, the paleoclimate proxies that I mentioned, understanding what the environment was like and the environmental backdrop. Um, a, a huge range of different disciplines contributes to this. Gregor and I are speaking today as two people, but we're representing a group of more than 50 um, researchers who individually bring to bear something on, on the nature of the questions that we seek answers to. So it's a very, it's a tremendously exciting and interesting time to be working on this. The other thing that I think has changed a great deal that isn't related to archaeological science is the, is the question um, surrounding um, the indigenous uh, people and their role in understanding and looking at, into these um, important questions. Um, in the past, uh, Western science has run roughshod uh, over um, the views and interests of um, Native American people in particular. And um, we all know uh, the, the situation um, with respect to people in places like the United States and, and other countries. Um, but now there's much more of a collaborative intent and people are reaching out and, and listening and working together. And this is another really exciting 
our future aspect of this. We're, we're seeing a lot of change in that area too. So there are a lot of changes that are happening, both in terms of understanding the archeological past and partnering with the people who are at the center of these very important and interesting questions. Thanks for that, uh, Tom. Uh, Gregor, did you want to just come into that question of, you know, as it were, what's, what's new, what's changed if we were looking at this from, uh, you know, what would you not have known 10 years ago that we know now? Well, Tom took all the good answers, so I'll uh, go with the, the, the one that's not so good. Well, I, basically, just to sum up what Tom was saying is that really the word that you can associate with this, and this cuts across all the different archaeological science techniques, is resolution. I mean, we just, we have such a phenomenal amount of isotopic and genetic resolution now, but we also have things like geometric morphometrics, which allows us to interrogate the size and the shape of not just bones, but stone tools and a whole wide range of things. And when you have a large, a much larger sample size combined with a lot more resolution, suddenly the scale of question that you can ask just explodes and you can start to get insights into very micro changes that then give you a perception about very fine scale differences between populations, which allow you to flesh out that story. And I feel like we are getting really, I mean, we, what we know now, we couldn't even begin to know 20 years, much less be able to ask the questions that we're now asking. Even in terms of, I mean, one of another pig paper that Tom was involved with is about not just identifying populations, but looking at the introgression between the two of them. And so we now know about Denisovans, which we didn't know before, but more than that, we know that there exists a, uh, an individual that was half Denisovan and half Neanderthal, which also is, in, you know, would have been impossible 15 years ago. So all Brendan, of could these I, techniques was, are, are fantastic. Could I, could I jump in right on that point? Because actually that brings us to our first question that I think we fits in nicely there. It's from Christina, it's coming on YouTube. And Christina's question is, were there several types of hominins, in other words, human type uh, um, species that crossed over? And if so, how did they do that? In other words, is this just Homo sapiens DNA or is there something more complex going on? I'll throw that back to you, Will. Oh, well, I oh, unless Tom, Tom, oh, unless Tom, yeah. Tom, sorry, I'll throw it to you, Tom, in that case, sorry. Um, so it's a very good question and it's something that is really topical because uh, a few years ago, uh, a really quite interesting discovery was made in the Amazon, Amazonian area um, amongst uh, some of the human bones that were analyzed there. They found that there was a, the presence of Australasian-like DNA. And uh, this has subsequently been, been explored by two big research groups that reported in their papers um, in 2018. And um, one group found that there was, there was a signal that they could detect, and another group found that, uh, that, 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 that they couldn't uh, be sure. So it's still a big outstanding question. Now, um, this, uh, the suggestion has been made that this um, Australasian DNA might have come via modern humans that came into the Americas much earlier which may fit with the idea that we've been putting forward in terms of Chicahuite Cave and other sites in South America that remain controversial, that there may have been a much earlier presence of people that were bearing this kind of um, genetic motif. Um, I think that it's unlikely at this point that there were other kinds of humans like Denisovans or Neanderthals that made that crossing. And that's not because they couldn't do it. We know that Denisovans cross large tracts of water to get into probably into, you know, east of, uh, um, of island Southeast Asia. Um, but it's, it seems that um, the archeological evidence is too late for Denisovans. We think Denisovans probably disappear around 40 to 45,000 years ago at the latest. So it may be a little bit too early for them. But we do know that people in East Asia interbred with uh, Denisovans. And we know that Native Americans do have a proportion of, a small proportion, albeit of Denisovan DNA. So I think it's, it's likely that perhaps what we're seeing in the, um, in the human DNA story is that we're missing a population that contributed to modern groups, albeit in some small parts of the Americas. So this is a big active area of research now. Lots of um, geneticists are interested in trying to probe other ancient uh, genomes from ancient bones to figure out uh, whether or not there was an earlier lineage, we call this lineage Y, whether or not there was this lineage and they, whether or not they contributed to small, smaller populations that, that are around today. We have some evidence for it, but not, um, not a great deal of wide evidence yet. And it's still, as I say, a subject of active research. And I think we, we should point out too, um, we would be remiss not to point out that you can read about this story and many other fascinating stories in Tom's new book, which has been uh, fully finished and accepted and is coming out next year, I believe. And Tom, what's it called? Uh, the World Before Us. You Thank you, Gregor, for the pitch. I really appreciate Absolutely. that. Uh, okay, I'm just getting a little bit of glitching here, and I'm not sure if that's coming from. Uh, no, are we okay? I think we're, we're doing okay, so we'll, we'll plow on ahead. Gregor, can I stay with you because um, I'm getting some questions here, which are the equivalent of 
homonym shaman and one of the dogs. So I'm going to throw uh, a lot of dog lovers out there. They want to know more. And let me throw a couple of vague questions straight back to you. Um, so here's one from Ben that's coming on Facebook. Do we know anything about how these groups of people will have tamed or brought the dogs into their group? And I'll link that to James' question also on Facebook. Is there a specific dog breed today that the earliest dog would have been the ancestor of? Could I take it back to you? Yeah, so you'll notice that uh, in my slides, I didn't mention anything about the origins of dogs. I, I think there's a, a, it was an intentional thing because despite having worked on this for, for 15 years and having a, a large group of collaborators and friends who are, are working on similar questions, the origins are still very much hard for us to pin down. And one of the reasons for that is one of the things that we do know is that it looks like the ants, we know that all dogs come from gray wolves, but the specific population of gray wolves that gave rise to dogs appears now to be extinct, which makes it really hard to pin down the time and place where this process took place. So we are in an interesting situation where because there are so many dogs globally and because gray wolves are present across uh, both all the Americas as well as Eurasia, it makes it, just looking at modern data alone, it makes it very hard for us to say with any kind of precision where things are actually starting, especially since there's been so much turnover with people moving around and migration and dogs mixing and every, uh, it's just madness. So we are, we feel like we are starting to get to grips a bit with this. And this evidence that we that I was just talking to you about suggests possibly that if the most recent common ancestor for the dogs in the Americas was about 15,000, it looks possibly like somewhere in Eastern Europe Asia, maybe Siberia is a place where this process kicked off and, and maybe a bit before that. Um, perhaps I can, perhaps I can, yeah, perhaps I can add something to that, Gregor, but yeah. um, which I find really fascinating um, in terms of what I was talking about, about the megafauna um, and the extinction of all of these genera. Now, um, because our, because the human DNA story that we have to date, regardless of the earlier presence of people, um, is so similar to the dog story. Um, it's tempting to think that rather like um, Pat Shipman suggested in terms of uh, her book, The Invaders, which as you might know, was a, was a, was a book which explored the um, singularly important role of dogs and early anatomically modern humans as they moved throughout the globe. Perhaps one of the key things was that you have these human hunters coming in before um, 16,000 years ago without the dog, but after 16,000 with the dog. And that was the key thing that perhaps um, enabled them to um, more successfully and ultimately um, extirpate the, um, the, the, the megafauna, the mammoths and the horses and the short-faced bears and so on. What do you, what do you, what do you think of that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not completely inconceivable. And several people have suggested exactly that explicitly for the megafaunal extinction in the Americas. I mean, the other possibility is something that resonates with today is, is a kind of a COVID situation where if people are bringing dogs and they have some kind of communicable disease, then maybe for a naive fauna that are in the Americas, if they acquire this and they don't have the immune systems, we know this happens with people when the Europeans arrive and, and many other places. So why not necessarily with the, the animals when the dogs or the people themselves arrive? So these are all questions that are you know eminently plausible but there has been very sparse evidence to to really either prove or disprove this and I think it could be a really interesting active area of research going forward. And what about um and what does the the other genetic story um tell us and um, regarding you know the DNA of other animals north and south of the um of the Laurentide ice sheet is there anything else that that, that sheds, sheds light on this human story that you know you um, or colleagues have worked on um you know, regarding this, these big questions? Well, we, we do have, we're working on a paper right now about uh, the genomics of dire wolves, which is one of the, the taxa that you had on one of your slides. And there's a lot of people who are actively working on trying to get DNA from some of these extinct North American megafauna and even the South American megafauna, because they are, you know, such mysterious beasts. We have these phenomenal bones. And there are some cases, you know, turtles as big as Volkswagen bugs and sloths that were standing 15 feet high and, you know, short faced bears, as you say, I mean, God, the modern bears are scary enough. Imagine some Something that was twice as big. So, um, and really trying to get to grips with the, the evolutionary history of a lot of those animals may suggest, as some other people have been doing, that perhaps rather than thinking about the disappearance of them as either one thing or another, you know, maybe it's more kind of maybe the climate is 
significantly reducing populations or making them highly inbred, making them much more susceptible where people end up being something like a coup de gras, where there's not much resistance to disease, though the populations are kind of teetering a little bit. And the other thing is because these things are so big and their gestation times would have taken such a long time, they probably wouldn't have needed much of a push to just fall out and, and knock everything over. So I, I feel like we might, you know, these false dichotomies between people or, or um, environment or climate change is, is a little bit, we know that it's false it's, and it's probably a combination of a lot of things. It's just now that we have a, a lot of this resolution or at least we're getting it, we're able to make those fine scale distinctions and, and really ask these questions. Hi both, uh, as you'll have seen, I'm, I'm not Rana. We've lost Rana temporarily, unfortunately. So hello to everyone at home. I'm Ben, I, I usually behind the scenes. I'm gonna carry on the questions just for a second, gentlemen, if, that, if that's okay with you. Uh, so we've had one from Stephen on Facebook who says, uh, this is a good question. What do you still not know about the people that you're studying that you're hoping to find out in the next few years as, as technology progresses? That's a great question. Tom. Can I start with that? So that's a really good question. And um, one, of the, um, one of the aspects of the Chikawite Cave uh, site is that we've only just begun work there and there's still a lot to, to discover and to find out. And you know, it's a, it's a unique site. It's, it's, it's high altitude. We've never found a site like it. The stone tools have never been seen before in the, in the Americas. And so it's a, it's a, there are loads of really big unanswered questions. And we also don't know what people are doing there. So we have a, a whole range of questions about that particular site that extend out to other places. Um, we want to know, we know what the people were doing there, what they were eating, you know, how they were seeing, who they were, how they relate genetically to later people. And so one of the, one of the big, um, new techniques that, that we can use to do this, I've already alluded to my talk, and that is the sediment DNA. Now, we, we found actually a, a signal of humans, human DNA in the archeological levels at Wite Cave, but it wasn't well enough so that we could be confident that it wasn't, um, you know, it was so small that we couldn't really be confident in linking it to a human population. So for that, we left it out of the publication. So more work is being done at the moment on that. And so it's really, it's really exciting to think that Maybe using sediments from the site would contain vestigial remains of human DNA that we could then start to put flesh on the bones, as it were, of who these people actually were and how they relate genetically to later groups and whether or not we can link them to other archaeological sites in the South of America that date to a similar um, period. So that to me is one of the most exciting things. The sediment DNA really is a revolution because it's been suggested that we may, in fact, not even need bones anymore to understand all of the um, past animals and humans that lived at an archeological site. Um, we, we always need bones, Tom. <laughs> we do indeed. Um, ladies and gents, I apologize for the fact that uh, when I warned at the beginning that sometimes home Wi-Fi glitches can cut you out, I wasn't entirely kidding, I wasn't kidding at all. So it would inevitably be in the last one of the, the season. I'm very glad that our wonderful guests and our hosts behind the scenes have kept it going. Um, I might, if I might throw in one last question, which was, was thrown in, which is rather a nice one to end on, I think, which is not just about the science, not just about the wonderful discoveries, but actually how it feels to discover these astonishing things about people who in one way are like us, in another way, lived in such a distant, such a remote understanding of humanity. And in this weird COVID period, you know, thinking about how life could be completely different, even while we're still human beings, I think has a lot of resonance to it. So perhaps I just got a quick final answer from both of you there. Um, and Tom, I see you nodding. Can I throw to you first? So um, I, this is one of the reasons that we work so hard and we, and we enjoy so much what we do and we want to find out new things and new answers to new questions because of that, that incredible thrill that you get from finding something out and then telling someone else about it and then sharing it with everybody and this is this is what uh this is what academic is all about and you know and why we're so privileged to be able to do it so yeah to me um the the, the discovery in this in the sense that you're finding out and you're sort of re um uh not repackaging but you know re reconstructing aspects of the ancient past is it's a tremendous thing to do um, and it's, it's, it's super exciting when you find out something that no one has known before. And the other thing that's really exciting is that for everything that you discover, there are always good research always throws up new questions. And so it's the new questions that then drive you on to, to try and solve those. So it's a combination of, of, of that that I think is, um, is the exciting aspect of, of doing research like this. And, and, and of course, the other final thing I would say is that it does have relevance to people today. And, and you know, we all want to know as humans who we are where did we come from? Why are we here? How do we relate to other people? Um, you know, what happened to us? These are fundamental human questions of, the, of, the, of our condition. And so um, using these exciting new techniques 
and, and, and enables us to, to get closer to, to the truth about this. And I think that's exciting for everybody, not just the researchers. Thanks very much, Tom. Um, Gregor, could I just throw that last question to you as well? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. I mean, and I, I, I completely agree with Tom. So much of it is about narrative and about understanding our place in the universe. And I feel like Tom does extremely privileged to be a part of piecing that narrative together and finding those puzzle pieces that allow us to better understand the past and how it relates to the present. And there was a moment during my PhD when I really, for the first time, got hit with this, where we, I got some sequencing results back. I was looking at my screen and a, a result just popped off the screen and, and hit me like a ton of bricks. And I was like, wow. And one of the things that really just blew me away was that I thought for a moment, I was like, wow, I am the only person in the world who knows this. And there was that feeling of like, not power, but just kind of respect for discovery and just how exciting the whole thing was. And then I was telling a, a friend of mine about it who was also an academia and because he's an academic, he was a bit cynical and he was like, yeah, you were the only person in the world who knew about it, but only three other people cared. And I, you know, which I take, you know, sometimes what we do is we, we think about really small little aspects of academia, but I think in this case, there's a lot of people who care. And it's really exciting to be involved in research for that has a huge, um, ramifications for, for people across the planet and thinking about our position, not just as individuals in our modern societies, but how we fit into the much larger global context going all the way into the deep time, even to the origins of our own species. Rekha, thank you very much. And I think both of your peons to discovery, which is at the heart of the research and teaching and learning that goes on, I mean, labs and universities and institutes around the world, but certainly here at the University of Oxford is a really good way for us to bring this series, or at least this season of, uh, of uh, Oxford at Home to a close. I'd first of all like to once again thank Gregor Larson and Tom Hyam for a really fantastic, fascinating research uh, presentation, which I think is gonna send a lot of people scurrying to find out yet more about what, uh, uh, what you do and also whether or not they can get any sort of um, genetic descendants of 14,000 year old dogs to uh, play with at home. I'm sure there'll be plenty of, uh, of uh, examination of, of, of that. I'd like to also thank um, a whole variety of people involved with Oxford at Home, uh, Ben Harwood, um, Greg, our technical uh, expert behind the scenes, uh, Tom Wilkinson, and all the others from the Public Affairs Directorate at the University of Oxford who brought this to, uh, together. They've done a fantastic job during this really awful time, but one that's at least enabled us to show how proud and how, um, I think, innovative we are in terms of our research and teaching here at Oxford. If you've enjoyed this series, then please do let us know, send us a message. We may even have a future series, not necessarily linked to a pandemic, we would hope, but just for the joy um, of it all. This is the last talk of this season, but you can find links to all the previous talks via our webpage, listed in the description below the video. And I think we'd like to thank all of our viewers and listeners around the world, particularly those who sent in questions and messages. I'm going to give Particular shout out to some regulars uh, like Gayatri and others who we've come, we feel as if we've come to know through the, uh, the chat function. Please do keep watching what we're, uh, what we're doing. Have a very wonderful summer. I hope that the disease and all these other awful things are reduced wherever you are and eventually we'll all get to meet in person. And don't forget when that happens, you're always very welcome here at the University of Oxford. And for now, let me just say from Oxford at home, a very good afternoon, especially to you. <laughs>